Super Talk Mississippi Media Production. You can wrap this one, my friend, in maroon and white. Ten seconds, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Bingo! You're listening to Thunder and Lightning on Super Talk Mississippi. Covering Mississippi State sports like nobody else. It's Wednesday night. You know what that means. It's Thunder and Lightning live here on Super Talk Mississippi. I'm Brian Haydad. Rhino down there in Studio X. He knows what time the show starts, and that's important, and I'm going to explain why in just a moment. We are brought to you by the good folks over at Visit Vicksburg, the Vicksburg Convention, and Visitors Bureau. We'll be talking about some of the great things happening in my hometown of Vicksburg, Mississippi, throughout the show. Rhino knows what time the show starts. I know what time the show starts. My family, no idea, apparently, what, what, what I do for a living or what time things happen, because literally as the music started, Rhino, I get a text from my oldest, hey, what's for dinner? <laughs> I'm kind of busy here. Kind of busy. But I told her. I told her. I'm making I'm uh, chicken tacos tonight. There you go. They should be should be delicious. I'll do a little cilantro lime rice and some green beans. I like green beans. But you know, maybe ask during. You, know, you had six minutes from six to six oh six where you could have worked that question in, and it wouldn't have been such a big deal. But it. At six oh six, I gotta kind of, you know, I gotta focus a little bit there. So, I don't think my kids have any clue how my uh, how my day goes and how how segmented it is in terms of of, of time. Like this, I can only do so much. I can only do so much. Ah, glad to be with you here on a Wednesday evening. If you want to join the conversation, you can text me on the C Spire text line six zero one eight seven nine four three nine five. I I don't know what you're having for dinner. So I can't help you with that if that's what you're going to ask me on the text line. But Mississippi State stuff, I'm happy to to have that conversation with you. Tough night for Mississippi State on Saturday. Tough night for Mississippi State fans staying up till 1 in the morning. Tough night for Mississippi State journalists uh, who had stepped till 2 in the morning getting all their work done, but whatever. Uh, but a tough night. And, and a, a game that and we talked about it last week, Mississippi State's postseason chances went from you know, with a win probably in the high 90s to a loss probably less than 50, and that's certainly where we are today after the 30 to 23 loss uh, to Arizona State. And the the message I want to to put out there that I said I've said a bunch this week, but you know I don't I don't know how you consume my content, so I'll say it here uh, as well. You, your first inclination is to look at the box score and say, well, 356 yards rushing. I mean. 346 yards, I'm sorry, rushing. Obviously, defensively, that's 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 why they lost the game. And you'd be wrong. You would be wrong. Mississippi State defensively, yes, the yard that's too much yardage. There's no question about that. But from a points perspective, the defense gave up 23 points. Seven of that is on the offense for a fumble. Even if it's all 30 points were on the defense. When you hire Jeff Levy, when you bring in Jeff Levy to do the things that he has done in his coaching career, you are you are kind of making the assumption that you're going to score more than 30 points a game. And State didn't do that. They only had three in the first half. They only rushed for 24 yards in the game. State lost this game because of its offense. Now, that's not to say that defensively they played well. They didn't. But if I gave the, uh, the defense a D+, plus, I have to give the offense an F. And yeah, they came back in the second half and made some plays. There's no question about that, but it was too little too late. I'm having Thunder and Lightning live for dinner. Give us the goods. I'm here. I'm here for you. Um, and that's, and that's, that's, that's an interesting way to think about things, right? But in, in, in this day and age of college football, it's just kind of is what it is. And I made this comment on Monday's podcast. I'll make it here. You know, because I've, I've all all season I've made these comparisons to Ole Miss and Levy's year there with the offense. The first year he was there as offensive coordinator, Kiffin's first year there, right? They were fantastic offensively. They were p- 
putrid defensively. And when you lose a game 51-35, when you lose 63-48, when you lose 55-48, and those are all real scores that Ole Miss lost by that year, then you could say, well, the defense lost these games. But when you lose 30-23, to and you only have three points in the first half, and you can only rush for 24 yards as a team, offensively you lost, is where you lost this football game. State, believe it or not, believe it or not, even with giving up 346 yards on the ground, believe it or not, State did enough defensively to win that football game. And I know that sounds weird, but it's absolutely true. And so, for me this week, offensively, State has got to find some running game. This offense is not an air raid offense. It cannot be one-sided. It cannot be unbalanced. You know, Mike Leach, when he talked about balance, he would talk, he was like, you know, balance to him was, I have the ability to move the football however I want to move it in the game. That's balance to Mike Leach. And he, I mean, I get what he's saying. I got what he was saying. You know, what difference does it make to him if I'm throwing or running if I can get eight yards? I don't care how I get it. That's fine. This offense is not that. This offense has got to have what the average football fan considers balance. Rush for 10, throw for 10. Rush for 20, throw for 20, and so on and so forth. We're going to talk a little bit more about Blake Shapin later in the show. I thought he was really good. Yeah, He had the, the bad fumble. There's no question about that. But, I mean, he made a lot of great plays for State. And the arm is as advertised with him and the accuracy and the deep ball. Love what I saw from Shapin. That running game has got to find a way to get going. And it's two-pronged. You're not getting great performances from your offensive line. You're not getting great performances from the running backs. They kind of go hand in hand. But a good running back can sometimes find a seam or two. A good offensive line makes it super easy. State's got to be better. And maybe it was you know a little bit of a pipe dream to, to say that you know five guys who had never played together before just all of a sudden going to become this cohesive unit. And it may take a little later in the season, but the problem is later in the season is when you're playing the heavyweights on your schedule. When you're playing teams that are currently, what, first, third, fifth, sixth, and seventh? Not great. That's not really the best time to be trying to develop chemistry. You kind of want to have that coming in. So it's going to be a tough road to hoe for Mississippi State now when you talk about wanting to go to postseason play because you're going to have to not only beat Florida, not only, let's, let's just start at the beginning here. you got to beat Toledo on Saturday. They'll do that. That, I believe. But then you got to beat Florida. you got to beat UMass. I think they'll do that. you got to beat Arkansas, who's much improved, much better than I thought they were going to be. And now we got to find another win. Get the six. Is that Texas A&M? I don't know. Or are you going to beat one of those top seven opponents that I just mentioned. That's where you've put yourself by losing that game. That's why I said the percentage just dropped so heavily from from postseason to no with a loss against Arizona State. State's going to have to pull off probably a massive upset. Since we were so exposed against this last Saturday against the run, obviously Toledo knows this. I'm probably going to try to do the same. Do you think the new D.C. will change schemes going forward? Sooner in the game rather than later, the neglect to do so worries me. The, the fact that Hutzler didn't adjust earlier in that game was pretty disappointing. Pretty disappointing. Um, I don't know about changing scheme as much as just making adjustments to what you're doing earlier is, is going to be uh, important. I think six win, wins was the pipe dream. I don't think that was a pipe dream. You know, To win your four non-conference games, especially back in the offseason, when Arizona State was picked dead last in the Big 12, that's, that's not a pipe dream to get to six. But now it's, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for them. Show us the multiple Hutzler. I, that was such a great question. from I, th- I think his name was Corey Ennis on the, uh, the rumblings the other day. Defensive quitter spends the whole offseason talking about being multiple and then just keeps running the same formation over and over again. Where was the multiple? I want multiple. I don't know. Uh, Caitlin in Corinth is having creamy ranch pork chops with garlic Brussels sprouts. Loves the show. That sounds really good. I love Brussels sprouts. One of the most underrated vegetables of all time. P. 
people who are like older than us, like my mom, Brussels sprouts are like the devil to them. You know why, right? Because they used to just boil them, and they stink well, when they're boiled. Now if people figure out you got to roast them, put them in the oven. That and and they have managed to kind of genetically modify them to where they're tastier now. Really? So like 1980, 1960s Brussels sprouts did not taste like 2024 Brussels sprouts? Yeah, they were much more bitter. Well, I'll be darned. I didn't know that. I'd, I never knew that. I never knew that. See, this rhino, we, we are a couple years into this show, but you, you taught me something today. I appreciate that. Good stuff. All right, when we come back, let's hear from Jeff Levy. This is from his Monday press conference. We haven't aired it yet here on Super Talk. Let's do that when we come back. What did Jeff Levy have to say following Mississippi State's loss to Arizona State uh, at his weekly press conference here in Star? We'll do that when we come back. This is Thunder and Lightning live here on Super Talk Mississippi. This is a spe- thunder and lightning on Super Talk Mississippi. You called down the thunder, well now you got it. Back here on Thunder and Lightning, I hate to cut off the Metallica, but we got to get to this uh, press conference. We are brought to you by our good friends over at Visit Vicksburg. This weekend at the Parkside Playhouse, the Vicksburg Theater Guild presents Much Ado About Nothing, a little Shakespeare in the city of Vicksburg. Go check that out uh, Friday and Saturday at 7.30 p.m., 2 o'clock on Sunday over at Parkside Playhouse. Tickets are $15, $10 for senior citizens and youth, and then cheaper as as you get younger and or older. If you need more uh, information, visit www.e-vtg.com or call 601 636 0471. Let's go now to the SEAL building. Let's hear from what Jeff Levy had to say earlier this week. Coach, I know when we talked Saturday night, you needed to review the tape. Now that you've looked at the tape, anything kind of stand out to you, good or bad, that you didn't see Saturday? Well, yeah, I mean, there's both sides of it in all three phases of the game. You want to play a heck of a lot better earlier so you don't dig yourself that 30-3 to hole. Again, incredibly proud of the guys for fighting and staying with it and continuing to play the next play in the second half, uh, creating a little bit of momentum, having the ability to cut it to a one-score game. But I think our guys, after watching the tape and having our Monday workout, just them understanding the fine line of being on the right side and the wrong side of things. And that margin of error of what it is when you're playing good football teams, when you're on the road like we were, understanding how clean you have to play to find a way to go win. And so that was a stress for us. That was um, the, the constant talk and the messaging is understanding that, man, it's all about the execution and uh, cleaning that part of it up and, and, and looking forward to being in Davis Way Saturday night. Right. Last week you talked to us about lessons in victory. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate you have to do it, but what are the lessons in defeat that you have to learn? Yeah, I, th- I think there's a bunch of them, especially going through this uh, as a group, you know, year one. Uh, our guys understanding that, that us as a staff, me, myself, uh, I'm going to be exactly who I was last Monday. You know, and they're not going to get somebody new or different in the building. And, and the, the trust and the culture that we've created over the last seven months is for these times it's not for the easy times like the the family the trust the connection it's for the times that are really really hard and to me that's when things get exposed our guys have answered uh the right way they had great attitudes and energy in the building this morning i do i think they were wondering how the building was going to be today and as they get off the practice field today i think they've got a great sense of understanding and we've got to find ways to get better. We've got to execute cleaner. Uh, but the people that are leading them are not going to be different people because of an outcome on Saturday. Steve. I know you're kind of just getting started on, to, on Toledo, but uh, what are your early impressions of them and kind of what they do defensively? Yeah, the, these, this football team and this program is incredibly established. 
a head football coach, been there nine years as the head coach, been there 16 years um, overall as a coordinator or a head coach. And so uh, their program is incredibly established. They've had a ton of success. Uh, for them to be able to come down here Saturday night, it will be no big deal for, for their program. And so stressing that for our guys and understanding exactly who we're going to get, uh, they've got a defensive unit that's got seven of the 11 starters as six-year players. They are an old, old unit. Uh, and then offensively, they've got some skill guys uh, that can do some really good things with the ball when, when they get it in their hands. So it is. It's going to be a total team effort. You know, they returned a kickoff for a touchdown last week. Uh, a running back who's a really good player for them that we got to make sure we bottle up and we tackle. Uh, and, then, and then make sure that he doesn't become a problem in, in special teams as well. So, again, a program that's won a bunch of games, uh, won a bunch of conference championships, and, and a staff that is incredibly established. So we'll, uh, we'll look forward to that challenge Saturday night. Coach, when you look back on the film, I guess mainly of this last game, and you look at the running game, is it, uh, I guess you obviously you look at the running backs and the offensive line too. What, what do you kind of see in there? Yeah, I did. you look at the running backs, the offensive line, the decision-making from a quarterback standpoint, when he should pull the ball or when he should hand the ball, how we're blocking the perimeter. So it is, it's a, the totality of it is what will give us a chance to be better in the run game and just way too many inconsistencies. You know, all day long in the run game, we had it the right people, but fundamentally we did not play clean. Uh, so, and, and I've talked about this a bunch and with our guys, like our intent was really good. Our execution has to be cleaner, bottom line. And so I've got to coach them better. We've got to coach them better to execute in a cleaner way. And again, I think our guys see that. Whether we're blocking the right guys or not, fundamentally, we have to be cleaner, whether that's on the perimeter, that's in the core, whatever it is. On the flip side, had trouble defending the run in that ball game. What were the biggest issues when you look back on film? And obviously had some players out, but what was kind of the biggest issues you saw from the line and, and kind of defending what they did running the football? Yeah, it, it's, it's one story, and it's tackling. You know, 25 missed tackles, uh, over 250 yards after contact. And I think that was the frustrating part for our guys is that when they watched the tape, uh, there were plenty of times where we were in position and we got to get the guy on the ground. You look at the first drive, second 10, QB makes an unbelievable play. We got him dead to rights, four yards in the backfield and, and not able to, to make the play. There's other times where just like I wanted different calls offensively, Coleman wants probably a couple back defensively. That's the reality of what we do. But we've got to find ways when we're in position, we got to make the play. And so, again, coaching them better. Uh, finding ways to, to make sure we're doing something a little different defensively uh, from a circuit standpoint, whether that's live tackling or what it is, to be able to go address it, and then playing cleaner on, on Saturdays. But our guys felt that as they watched the tape today. It's obviously only Monday, but how have you seen your guys respond after that loss, and how do you expect to see that you know going into this week ahead of Toledo? Yeah, I, our guys are going to fit off us. They're going to fit off me. And so their energy again in the building this morning was good. Our intent at practice was good. And people incredibly locked in and talking about, you know, being at our best Saturday night. And protecting our home field uh, is something that we are going to talk about inside our program nonstop. Our guys understand that. And they know the importance of, of playing really well Saturday night. Justin. Jeff, regarding, regarding the guys that were out on the defensive line, where are things at right now with uh, with Dink and Deontay and uh, Eric Taylor, too? Yeah, Eric is no longer with us. Uh, Dink and Deontay, hopeful uh, for these guys to be able to be back. It's too early in the week to know. Um, you know, they did a little bit today, but not much. We are planning as if we're not going to have these guys. Uh, so we'll see as we get later on in the week. We talked a little bit about you know the, the slow start uh, Saturday. Now that you've gone back and kind of kind of looked looked at that, what kind of stands out to you that uh, kind of caused the slow start at Arizona State? Yeah, it was without a doubt. Just like it's one story defensively in my mind, offensively it is it's one story, and it's the fact that we could not 
uh, play clean football on third downs. You know, we're in really good third down situations early in the game and don't have the ability to to make the play and stay on the field, whether it was settling for a field goal down there on fourth down on the third drive or the first two drives of the game being third and six, being third and three, and not executing in a way to give us a chance to to stay on the field, you know. So th those were the things that, again, offensively got stressed. We do, we've got to run the football uh, more effectively. Uh, the way they play defense and structurally, um, there were going to be more hats in the box than uh, than we could block at times. So finding ways to, again, be cleaner in the run game. But, man, we have to play better on third down for us to have a chance to stay on the field and go, go score points. Got a touchdown uh, rushing and receiving from your running backs. Just how did you feel about that unit on Saturday? Yeah, guys that, you know, they are. They're trying to take advantage of the opportunities they get. You look at the first two games, we haven't gotten a ton of carries. We hadn't gotten a ton of uh, opportunities. So guys not being able to get in a rhythm, I think, is part of the, the run game uh, right now. And that's, you know, that's with how the flow of the game has ended up. Uh, over the last two weeks. So they took really good care of the football. Ball was not on the ground from those guys, which was a huge improvement for week one. And now we got to find ways to win our one-on-ones, win in space, uh, but was proud of Vaughn for being able to go execute there and, and, and score that receiving touchdown there in the fourth. Right. Just watching the game, it felt like the tempo was a little slower week two than it was week one. Did you feel that as well? Did the team play as fast as you want them to? Yeah. And, at times we did. There were times where we weren't quite as fast. We got held a lot from an official standpoint. Um, so I think that was part of it. But I, I thought when we had the ability to play fast, I thought our tempo was pretty good. So we've already seen some impressive performances uh, by MAC teams this year. Just last week, Northern Illinois beating Notre Dame, Bowling Green gave Penn State all they could handle. Uh, is that sort of just like serving as, as fuel for your team? Like we don't want to be that next victim or, or get into trouble against a team like that? I, I don't talk about it that way. I talk about making sure we know exactly who we are playing and understanding Toledo has a really long history of playing really good football, winning football. Again, a program that is incredibly established and a group that, whether it was at Illinois last year and they end up getting beat by two, they go to Notre Dame two years ago, they lose by two. Like they have been in complete fist fights uh, with power four football teams and this will be nothing new for their program. So it's got nothing to do with anybody else but Mississippi State and then knowing exactly who we're getting Saturday night. Anything else? Appreciate it. Thank you. Thunder and lightning on Super Talk Mississippi. I am absolutely and completely thunderstruck. We are back here on Thunder and Lightning, Super Talk. Mississippi. I'm Brian Haydad. Thanks for joining me here on a Wednesday evening. We are sponsored by Visit, Visit Vicksburg at the Vicksburg Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, oh gosh, what day is it? This doesn't have the date on there. There we go. On Tuesday, September 17th, uh, the Southern Cultural and Heritage Foundation over on Adams Street. I certainly know that building very, very well. We'll sponsor Never Too Late to Create with Karen Biedenhorn. Uh, if you ever wanted to learn how to paint, this is your opportunity. 5.30 start at the Southern Cultural Heritage Foundation. Uh, $35 a person for the class, but only $30 if you're a member of the foundation. Uh, and it includes all supplies. So you just got to show up and learn how to paint, and it'll be a good time. So check that out uh, next Tuesday, uh, September the 17th. Also next week, here in my town, my, my adopted hometown, I guess, of Starkville, uh, Sports Talk Mississippi will be here live at the Greater Starkville Development Partnership. I have been efforting, I think that's a word, efforting, to get some folks there, so we're looking forward to that. I know, as, as usual, Dr. Keenum will join us. 
I believe Charlie Winfield will join us from the Bulldog Initiative. And maybe a few surprises as well. I think that, that scalawag Robbie Falk might join us as well. We'll find out. We'll see what happens uh, next week at the Greater Startville Development Partnership. So you heard from Coach Levy there. And, you know, he talks about having some calls he could regret. And he says Coleman probably feels the same. Coleman Hutzler, Mississippi State's defensive coordinator. I thought that in that in the uh, in the press conference, he did a good job of doing what I think coaches should do. I think they should accept the blame and dole out the credit. You know, I think that you, when you have a coach who takes credit for things but doesn't want to take blame for things, that is a coach that's going to have a, a fan base that's not too fond of him unless he's winning big. Whereas you have a coach who, you know, is willing to take the blame and then turn around and say when there's credit to be given out, it was his players, it was his assistant coaches. That's how you build a, a great relationship with your fans. So I think that's a good thing from, from Levy. Another good thing from Jeff Levy was bringing in Blake Shapin. And that was a decision that we talked about at the time as we were we were we were we were confused might be the best the West, the best word. I remember it very distinctly talking about it on uh on Sports Talk Mississippi. It broke in the final segment on a Friday. So, you know, our, sec- our, our times run, so we start at 5.53, go to till 6, and that's the end of the week. And I think at like 5.54, I see a tweet, I think it was from Pete Thamel, who said Mississippi State has received a commitment from, from Blake Shapin. And if you'll recall at that time, you know, Dylan Gabriel was still very much on MSU's board, and they were hopeful to bring him in for a visit. Um, he obviously went to Oregon and never left. And so it just it, it was completely out of nowhere. And then you had you know I knew who Shapin was and was familiar with him, but I knew at the time, and I, I still believe I think he was willing to come here just just to be here because State was still hot on on the trail of some other transfer quarterbacks. They ended up you know striking out on those guys, and so Shapin. I'm not saying he won the job by default, but he became the favorite, and he had a great spring. I loved what I saw from him in the spring game. And I like what I've seen with him from him thus far. He's completing passes at almost a 70% clip. He's five touchdowns to no interceptions. State averaged 15 yards per completion last weekend. You think about, you know, State the, the past few years with the air raid, you know, you were much closer to eight, nine, ten yards per completion. So State's getting those big plays in the passing game. The 80-yard touchdown wasn't a, a deep throw, but the nature of this offense allows you to have that kind of run after the catch. The week before, you did have a long touchdown pass, a 65-yarder. That was, a, I think, in a 54-yarder. Both of those were 40-plus yards in the air. So I and I, you know, you can't deny the toughness. We we talked about it last week. You know, we like to see them maybe be a little bit more. Uh, what's the word? We're for? I, I don't want to say careful because I feel like when you tell football players to be careful, that's how you get them hurt. But you know he did run the ball with some reckless abandon two weeks ago, so we'll see if that can continue. But I've been very pleased with Shapin uh, thus far. So uh, let's see here. I've, somebody asked me if during the press conference was I the one who asked the question about tempo, and it was. I, I had I had two questions. I had the one about lessons in defeat, and I had the one about tempo. He said I've been listening to you guys for almost daily for a few years now, and it's strange to hear y'all's voices away from Super Talk, like in interviews or other broadcasts always catches me off guard. I I was walking to a game, uh, a baseball game, earlier this year, and it, it was a day where the, it was a little rainy outside, and somebody said something to me, and I, I was just like, well, it looks like the weather is going to clear out in about an hour. And she just looked at me, and she's like, are you Brian Hey, Dad? And, <laughs> and I said, yeah, yes, I am. She's like... Your voice. I knew your voice. And that's so odd to me. I had, I had lunch with my mom today, and this person's like, Brian, what do you think is going to happen this weekend? And I just, you know, I, I told him, I was like, I think we'll be fine. It'll be fine. I sat down with my mom, and she's just like, I'm going to do my mom impression here. Do you know him? No, mom. I don't know who that is. He called you Brian, though. It's like, yes, yes, mom. People know who I am. And it happens every now and then. It's still weird. Still weird when it happens, but it, it does happen. Thank you guys. I, I appreciate you so much. You have no idea. Uh, at the end of the day, does State have the players to turn this around or not? Well, I mean, turning it around this season? No, you just got what you got. You, if you get to six wins, great. Other, other than that, you just do the best you can. Next year, you'll have new players because you'll hit the portal. Moving on. Uh, so I like Shapin. I really like what I'm, I'm seeing from him. And, you know, 
the, the obviously you only have one year with him is 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 what is not great. You'd like to have another year with Blake Shapen because I feel like you know Corral year one and, and under Levy was really good. You know I, I I've pointed this out a, a bunch of times. He had 14 picks that year, but 11 came in two games. So those are just anomalies, right? The next year he's 20 touchdowns, three interceptions. The the jump the 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 was was huge, and he was just. I mean, he was he was the best quarterback in the SEC that year, other than Bryce Young, who won the Heisman Trophy. I don't know that Leb or that uh, that Shapen could make that kind of jump, and I don't know that Mississippi State had the players around him to help him make that jump. I just know that I wish I had another year of Blake Shapen. So, I think he's been really good, and I like I like uh, I like the receiving core. You know, I'm trying to find. I want to, you know, we've been so negative this week, and and I'm not. You guys know me. You guys know me. You know, I don't get in the whole positive negative thing. We're just going to talk truth. You know, the truth is neither negative or positive. The truth just is what it is. State played poorly Saturday night. Defensively, they were awful. Offensively, they were not good enough. Those are all true statements. But you can also say that their receiving core has been really good this year. Jordan Mosley finally seems to be putting it together. Kevin Coleman has had two great games. Uh, I love what I'm seeing from the freshman Mario Craver. And Akari finally getting on the field Saturday night. He had only had the one catch, but he's out there now. I think he'll add his name to this, this list pretty soon. One thing to remember about this offense, and this one we've brought up a few times, is that for whatever reason, it doesn't spread the wealth like, like the air raid did. You know, under Leach, you'd have... You know, one lead dog receiver, but then you have another guy with like 25 catches behind him, and then, you know, you'd have one guy with like 60 catches, and then one guy with 40, and then three guys with 30. And this offense, with Levy at, at Ole Miss and at Oklahoma, has had like one receiver that's just head and shoulders above everybody else, and then everybody else just kind of falls in the line. You know, you look, you think back to uh, his first year at Ole Miss, Elijah Moore with that monster season. The next guy had like 25 catches. I don't think that's going to be the case here. It feels like it's almost going to be a little bit more by committee through these first couple of games anyway. Nobody has has stepped forward to become that alpha dog receiver. The same way uh, that uh, that nobody stepped forward to become the alpha dog running back. I thought there was a chance Shapen had another year Josh from Laurel. So let's, let's talk about that real quick. So let's go through it. As it stands right now, he's out of eligibility. His first year at Baylor... He played in his four games, then he played in the Big 12 championship game, and that's where he got hurt. At that time, the NCAA rule was not postseason games don't matter, right? Now you can play four games and still play in a bowl game or play in a championship game and still redshirt. You can do that now. You could not do that in 2021. There has been some talk that State might appeal to the NCAA and say, look, that was the rule then, but this is the rule now. He he got hurt in that game. Can we can we cough up another year of eligibility? And in today's NCA, the environment that it's in, where it's basically like we're just going to give the players what we want, otherwise they're going to sue us. You might win that. You might win that appeal. So I, I it'll just be on it'll be on Shapen. Does, does he want to come back for another year? Shapen could have a really good year this year and, and get some pro interest. So we'll see. It'll be on state. Do they want to bring him back? I would think they would. Otherwise, you're just going to have to go back into the portal. I can't imagine going into the next year with just Parson, Van Buren, and, and Taylor. And then it depends on the NCAA. So there, there's, a, there's a chance, but it's, it's not anything set in stone by any stretch of the imagination. So that's from Josh from Laurel. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I would think he would like to be back. You would like to have him back. I don't know if he'll want to be back, and I don't know if the NCAA would allow him to be back. So... We'll worry about that when we get there. That's a long way away uh, for him. But it's been a great start to the season, the first two games for Blake Shapen. Not from a win-loss perspective, obviously, but from a a personal standpoint, he's been really, really good for the Bulldogs. All right, we're going to wrap things up when we come back. And we'll do that in just a few minutes. This is Thunder and Lightning Live here on Super Talk Mississippi. If your engine is a thunder and lightning on Super Talk Mississippi. Listen up! There is a storm coming!
One last go around with you here on Thunder and Lightning here on Super Talk Mississippi. Thanks for joining me here on a Wednesday night. It's Brian Haydad. Rhino down there in Studio X once again has almost taken us to a complete uh, and, you know, stop. We will, we will not get out of the car until he does, though. Great question here on the C Spire text line that we'll finish up the show with. It's a long and loaded question. By your own words, this is not going to be a great season for Mississippi State. After this season, how do we go about recruiting and getting people out of the transfer portal to come to state? Will it be pure NIL money, Mississippi State brand, faith in Jeff Lebby? I would love to know your opinion. Well, obviously NIL will play a huge role when you're talking about the transfer portal. You know, it's it is it is not the most important thing, but it's very, very, very important. What the, and I've I've said this before, and I said it on Monday's podcast. What people need to understand about NIL is that it's not Amazon, guys. You can't just say, I need a defensive tackle, click. Okay, it's coming. Be here in two to three days. That's not how it works. You still got to recruit these guys. And that's part of the problem that State had this year was that they had an inexperienced and, and unknown defensive staff. And a lot of guys didn't want to put faith in those guys. And I get that. So what State needs to do is twofold on the defensive side of the ball. Is either Hutzler gets this group playing a lot better by the end of the year, and then he can start – to sell guys on that, or if it doesn't happen, you have to you have to make a change there, and we'll see if that's the case. Offensively, you just got to show proof of concept, is what they call it, and that's a lot of what Kiffin did in year one. They were they were much better at Ole Miss in year one than State's probably going to be this year, but he showed that that team was going to be exciting and moving the football up and down the field, and so it was easy to attract players. Levy needs to be able to do, do the same thing. So there'll be some NIL, there'll be some faith in, in Jeff Levy. Mississippi State's brand, I, I would say in the transfer portal, brand is, is, is kind of unimportant. You know, those guys want to go somewhere where they can win and they can go to the next level. And so it doesn't really matter who provides them with that. They'll, they'll, they'll jump on it. If, if, if a guy feels like he has a chance to take a starting job and play a lot and get a lot of attention that, and the NIL package is right, they'll take it. They'll take it. So, NIL, though, yeah, it, it plays a huge role. And I, I, I don't think that it's, like I said, it's, it's not, it is and isn't the most important thing, if that makes sense, right? In other words, you can't come into it with the idea that, well, we're not, you can't do the Dabo thing and just say, oh, we're not going to do the transfer, we're not going to do NIL, we're not doing that. You can't have that. You've got to take NIL seriously. Every recruiting discussion has got to have some mention of NIL and what the opportunities are for you when you when you sign with that school. At the same time, though, you can't just say, well, we had the best offer. Now, I mean, I guess you could make some godfather offers out there, but that's, that, that's poor for business, I think. You know, you could tell a guy, but I mean, I'll just go ahead and tell you, and I talked about this on the podcast, I know for a fact. State made a couple of godfather offers to players who are not at Mississippi State right now because they just want it to be somewhere else. Or they did, weren't, they, the other aspects of the recruiting process didn't click for them the way the money would have. Think about your own, your own jobs, right? I'm sure there's a godfather number that could get you to do any job I, I offered you. There's a number I can be like, look, I want you to go out and, you know, you're going you're gonna to come to my house every day and. You know, you have to go in the litter box, and you, you see where I'm going. There's a number. It's really high. Do you want to do that, though? And so if the numbers are relatively comparable, you're not taking that job. So not to compare going to Mississippi State to having to eat out of a litter box, but my point remains that it, it's not always about the money. Now, the money plays a huge role. How can a losing team recruit? Losing team recruits, losing teams recruit all the time. All the time. Freeze in his first year at Ole Miss went six and six. He signed the top ten recruiting class. Yes, I know. But still, nowadays you can do those the thing those things. Kiffin had a great had, Kiffin has been able to recruit once he before he got things going, he he because you drum up excitement. People people Think that losing sometimes. Now, if you're a perennial every year loser, if you're a three and nine every year, yeah, tough to recruit. But for the most part, those kids don't worry about that. They want to come to your school because of their relationship with the coaches, for the ability to play right away, and for the ability to go to the next level. And if you can offer those things, 
you can recruit anybody as long as you've got, you know, like I said, the, the NIL has to be there, but you don't have to godfather everybody. You don't have to make everybody these offers they can't refuse. You just make your offer. You make what you feel is your best offer, and you go from there. Hope that answers your question. If not, well, I'll keep trying. Tune into the Thunder and Lightning podcast. Tune in here. Tune into Sports Talk Mississippi. You can always find me. Also, don't forget this Saturday after the game, Thunder and Lightning live on YouTube. Please join me for a uh, post game recap from the Davis Wade Stadium press box. Talk to you guys tomorrow on Sports Talk Mississippi. For Rhino down there in Studio X, I'm Brian Haydad. Thanks for listening to Thunder and Lightning here on Super Talk Mississippi. Talk Mississippi Media Production.